Hello, I'm Elizabeth Sobel, President and CEO of the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Welcome to this incredible performance by pianist Jonathan Biss. So Jonathan Biss was scheduled to have joined us for this summer's Beethoven 2020 Festival here at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. He would have played the magisterial Beethoven Concerto No. 5, The Emperor, along with Louis Langre and the Philadelphia Orchestra. So this is part of what we're calling SPAC Reimagined. Who are we, what are we, when we can't open the gates to the grand, best-in-class marvel of an amphitheater here at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. So when we began to think of what we could do virtually and in intimate smaller gatherings to celebrate not only the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, but also what SPAC is, what it fundamentally is, what we've got for you this evening is Jonathan Biss, an extraordinary pianist, performing Beethoven and also talking about Beethoven, bringing you his insight and his thinking about his work. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello, I'm Jonathan Biss, and uh, welcome to my house, which uh, just this once is standing in for the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Very sorry not to be with you in Saratoga for obvious reasons, but I am glad that it's still possible for me to play for you uh, in this way. Uh, this is going to be a slightly unusual concert, not just because it's uh, a virtual one, but uh, also because it's going to be a kind of a concert with commentary. Uh, I don't always like to talk uh, in concerts. There's this part of me that really wants to allow uh, the music to speak for itself when I play. Uh, but I, I am happy to make an exception uh, when it's Beethoven that I'm playing because his music really is infinitely interesting. Um, I, I've spent really the last 10 years of my life uh, immersed in his piano sonatas, uh, recording them. This year I would have performed all 32 um, as a cycle if um, those cycles hadn't been interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, and the reason that I've been playing um, and devoting myself to these 32 sonatas you know, whereas normally I'm not someone who's attracted to doing things complete. I just pick the pieces that I love and play them, uh, rather than thinking it has to be by this composer, you know, from this genre. The reason I, I've, I've spent this amount of time on the complete Beethoven's is because they're not just uh, of uniformly high quality, but they're remarkably different from one another. It's really amazing that he was able to write 32 pieces that are of such an extraordinary level without really ever repeating himself. He didn't sort of have a bag of tricks that he would rely on and fall back on. Um, he was constantly inventing and reinventing the form. Um, and I just think that's uh, miraculous and, and really unique. There is really not a, another composer who achieved that and so I think that because each one of these sonatas is so unlike the others, it's interesting to talk about the ways in which that's the case. And uh, in this concert, I am going to play one of the pieces that's, um, I guess you would call it a, a chestnut, one of the, the best known and best loved works, that's the Waldstein. Um, but I also think that one of the, the reasons that playing the cycle in beta sonatas has held my interest for all these years is that. It's led me to so many of these works, um, many of them from the early period, that I might have um, overlooked if I hadn't decided to play all 32. Uh, there are so many gems from Beethoven's early years, uh, which again are not just great, but are also very specific in terms of their content and how they function. And the first piece I'm going to play for you today definitely falls very much in that category. It's the Sonata Opus 14 number two. Uh, and these two sonatas, Opus 14, um, they're written in 1799. I think he was just under 30 years old. Beethoven was not a, a child prodigy of the Mozart variety. Um, he um, did publish his Opus 1 until he was in his mid-twenties. And, you know, Opus 14 sounds early, but, you know, Opus 13 is the pathetique. So we're talking about someone who was fully mature, whose personality was 
100% there already. Um, and when I say that each one of these pieces is uh, unique, I mean both in terms of form and in terms of content. And this piece has uh, qualities which are so um, far away from our stereotype of Beethoven. We think of Beethoven as someone idealistic, driven, tough-minded. Um, we also think of him as someone who was maybe not overly concerned with beauty, not someone who um, was as interested in themes that were incredibly beautiful as he was in what he could do with those themes. You know, we think of him as sort of taking his motives and sort of wrestling to them, them to the ground and manipulating them and developing them and uh, having his way with them. But in the first movement of Opus 14, number one, we have from the very beginning music of just overwhelming beauty. Just the, the sheer melodic contours of it are so perfect. Um, and they create this atmosphere of, of warmth and of tenderness, and I, I think a little bit of nostalgia as well. And again, because we have this image of Beethoven as this bloody-minded person, I find that the moments where he... Um, he showed the tender side to be just all the more touching. Uh, and this is just a perfect case uh, of that side of Beethoven coming to the fore. Um, and then the other two movements feature another uh, side of Beethoven's personality, which is not that often discussed, even though it frankly should be, and that is Beethoven's humor. Uh, Beethoven has an incredible sense of humor, but somehow because he's also so lofty, I think very often we we um, we skate past that side of him, and um, both the second and third movements of this sonata are absolutely filled with jokes. Uh, the second movement is a kind of march, and um, a march implies something very serious and almost solemn, and uh, the sort of the dissonance between um, that would be seriousness and the actual character of this music, which is, you know, tongue very much in cheek, is what makes it so delightful. I mean, there's, uh, there's this sense of Beethoven um, just barely managing to keep a straight face to this theme, which is, even, even the shape of the theme is kind of a joke, because it's, it's two halves, which should be kind of the same length, but in fact the second half is much longer, and it has a tail at the end of it, and it's repeated, which the first half is not So the whole thing is kind of um, uh, gimpy, I guess I would say. Um, and the, the, it's, a, it's a set of three variations, the second movement, which begins with a joke and it ends with a joke. I mean, the theme, which was a march at the beginning, starts to break down at the very end. And I, I don't want to say what happens at the very, very end, because I don't want to give away the joke in the piece that you're about to hear. And the third movement um, is, the humor is even more explicit than how he calls this movement a scherzo. Scherzo is the Italian word for joke. And uh, normally, scherzi were movements which were inserted in the middle of a four-movement sonata. So again, having it as the last movement shows that even though this is a minor piece, it's not that long, it's um, not on its surface so ambitious, but it's, it's shaped in a way that is unlike any of the other 31 sonatas. And again, the humor is, is explicit here. You know, you, it's a movement that's um, in 3A, three beats to a bar. And from the very beginning, he divides it not in groups of three, but in groups of two. Um, so he's already sort of um, playing a, a, I would say, not so subtle rhythmic game. And that's a sort of a first little um, winking joke uh, in a movement that's actually full of them from beginning to end. It's uh, you know, when I say that Beethoven has a sense of humor, you know, maybe you were thinking, oh, it's probably very witty and sophisticated humor. Not always. Sometimes Beethoven is, is willing to be silly or even ridiculous. This is, this is a person, after all, who wrote a piece called uh, Rage Over a Lost Penny. And this is not quite Rage Over a Lost Penny material, but it's, uh, it's Beethoven just having a, a rollicking good time. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, a piece which uh, showcases some of Beethoven's most wonderful and maybe uh, less appreciated qualities, and one which um, I love very much.
for bringing those qualities to the fore. So here is Beethoven's Sonata in G major, opus 14, number 2.
So now we move from one of Beethoven's uh, lesser known gems to one of his most beloved, uh, you might even say ubiquitous works, and that's the Sonata Opus 53, the Waldstein Sonata. Um, I think one of the, the most compelling aspects of the Beethoven Sonatas as a, as a body of music is the evolution that takes place from the Sonata number no. one, which is Opus 2 number no. one, and to the Sonata number no. 32, which is Opus 111. Um, this is a person whose personality is incredibly strong and really incredibly consistent from beginning to end. Again, you know, early Beethoven is not a, a child. He's, uh, he's fully formed as a, as a human being and as an artist. Um, so that the personality is totally evident and uh, unmistakable, really, from the beginning. And yet, um, the language of the music and his idea about the form of the sonata, about, about the way in which a sonata can be shaped, changed profoundly from early life to late life. And I think that while um, the form was always evolving for Beethoven, there are uh, two or three really critical points. One might call them pivot points. And the Waldstein Sonata for me is really one of those. Um, you know, I, I used the word ubiquitous a minute ago to describe it. And I think with these pieces that we hear all the time, um, frankly, not always played especially well. Um, it's easy to take them for granted, to take their greatness for granted, to take their innovations for granted, um, to take their wildness for granted. Uh, and I was very guilty of that. I, I have to say, I, I, I only learned the Vulture Sonata uh, in my 30s, and I sort of vaguely knew that it was a great piece uh, before playing it, but, but, you know, it had just been around all the time, and so it was easy to um, to overlook it, really. And I, I, you know, shame on me, but when I, I finally learned the piece, I was really blown away by many aspects of it. Um, some of Beethoven's sonatas that have nicknames have nicknames which make an attempt to describe some of the emotional content of the work, the pastoral, the appassionata, the, the pathétique. And I sometimes wish that the Waldstein, instead of being called Waldstein after its um, dedicatee, was, you know, uh, given the, the name of the Sonata of Wonderment, because that is the, the aspect of the music that, um, that grabs me every time I hear it. I think there's a tendency for it to be played in a somewhat athletic, muscular way, and there is that aspect to it, but it's somehow, for me, not the dominant one, and it's really not the one that makes it so remarkable. Uh, the sonata is written in, I think, 1804. It's really only five years after the Opus 14, number two, which I just played, but you'll hear that in many ways it's a, it's a world apart. Uh, and when I said that it, it's a kind of a pivot point in terms of the evolution of, of Beethoven's style and his, um, his use of the sonata as a form, uh, I mean two things above all. Um, the first is um, a question of his harmonic language. And uh, Beethoven as you know, sort of the third in the great triumvirate of classical era composers, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, he really inherited certain ideas about harmony, um, which were very, very strongly ingrained by that point. You know, the idea being that you begin in the tonic key, and then your motion is from the dominant, from one to five. And every single work in a major key in Mozart and in Haydn and the early period of Beethoven obeys that rule. You know, it's like there's a contract between um, Beethoven or either of his predecessors, the composer, and the listener. And um, to go against that tonic to dominant motion would be to break the contract. 
And that is, in fact, exactly what Beethoven does in uh, the Volta Sonata, where instead of going to the expected destination of G major, the dominant, he goes to E major, the mediate. And uh, it's not easy uh, in 2020 to convey what a um, what a remarkable and daring uh, move this was. I mean, Beethoven has always been uh, obsessed with the median, with as a as a key, as a as a sonority. He uses it in slow movements of pieces and in odd moments of pieces from the very beginning of his life. But to use it as a major destination is to sort of um, to tear up the rule book. And it is unbelievable the effect that it has in this piece, you know, when the second theme arrives and it's not in the, ton in the dominant of G major, but instead in this E major, it creates this sense of having opened a door into a, a parallel universe, into some kind of an Eden. Um, and uh, it's, it's, again, it's not easy, um, you know, with literally hundreds of music, of hundreds of years of, of subsequent music, which has gone into such wild uh, directions to, for, a, for a performer to convey just what a huge event this is, but it is the responsibility of the performer. I, that's what I, I'm almost more interested in doing in this first movement than anything else is conveying the, the, the sense of adventure that this E major brings. So that's the one uh, rule that he uh, really breaks, or rather, I should say, maybe rewrites with the Waldstein Sonata. And the other one, which is maybe even more significant, has to do with the overall shape of the work, that if you look at these uh, early period sonatas, even ones which, unlike Opus 14, number 2, which I just played, are grand and ambitious, you know, I think of Opus 2, number 3, and Opus 7, and, and many others, um, these are big pieces, you know, nearly half an hour long, um, um, muscular, spiritual, and this long with you know, f f big in scope and imagination. But those pieces all put their weightiest music and their weightiest statements towards the beginning. And as they progress, uh, a certain likeness um, begins to set in. Uh, that was, again, the model that Beethoven inherited, you know, in Mozart and, and Haydn, not just their piano sonatas, but in their symphonies and their string quartets and their other chamber music pieces, they, you know, big first movements, sometimes very profound slow movements, and then, and then something, I don't want to say more frivolous, but certainly uh, more lighthearted happened afterwards. And Beethoven rebels against this in subtle ways from the beginning, but the Waldstein is really the piece where he flips the model. That the piece, while clearly its ambitions are made from the very beginning, it begins very, very quietly and with what I always think of as sort of potential energy. It's, there's, there's something enormous within it, but it's very contained. And the first movement, you know, has plenty of moments where that energy bursts forth, but it is still aiming further than that. And this is the first sonata where the last movement is not in any way lighter, but in fact it is the longest movement of the piece, and it is the destination that everything before it has been leading up to. The finale is of grand proportions and it's uh, the sort of music that only Beethoven could write which seems to be aiming at infinity. Um, and it's it's very interesting that this sonata was originally conceived as a three movement piece where the middle movement was a very beautiful uh, sort of slow-ish rondo um, and Beethoven somehow realized that uh, that movement wasn't somehow right for the piece. And he still clearly loved it because he published it as a freestanding piece, which is called the Andante Favori. But in its place, he put an incredible slow movement, um, which is very slow and very mysterious, but which tellingly is marked introduction. As great as this music is, 
its role in sharp opposition to the movement that he had originally put here, its role is to lead, lead us inevitably and inexorably towards the finale. And uh, when that finale comes, well, it's, again, the only word I can use is wonder or wonderment. It, it has, th it's like looking out into the horizon on the clearest day in, in human history. And again, it begins with a certain kind of calm and uh, that with, within it, which is contained at the beginning, opens and opens and opens and opens and opens um, until it really encompasses all of humanity and, um, and all that we can see and what's beyond our vision as well. And that is uh, so much of the greatness of Beethoven. Uh, so I, uh, again, I feel sort of mortified that I went through so many years of my life without realizing uh, that the Waldstein Sonata is not only um, famous, but it is extraordinary. Um, I said earlier that I, um, I am so happy that I decided to play the Beethoven cycle because it introduced me to pieces that I might have missed otherwise, but equally it forced me to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into pieces like the Walsh Sonata, which uh, really reward that kind of digging. And digging into this piece has been one of the gifts of my life for years. And uh, so it gives me great joy to share it with you.
listening or sharing in this magnificent music with me. Uh, I don't know if maybe it's a little weird to play an encore after a concert that's not quite a concert. Nobody applauded. But I would like to play one more short work for you. Um, the last thing that Beethoven ever wrote for the piano was not the last piano sonata, Opus 111, but the very poignant Six Bagatelles, Opus 126. This is the first of them. Thank you. 